Okay, so we can get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. It's just about 1 p.m. Eastern Time on September 23rd, 2024. Welcome to the September 2024 COVID Information Commons Research Webinar. My name is Emily Rothenberg, and I'm the Program Manager of the National Student Data Corps, the KIC sister program underneath the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University. I'm also a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. I'd like to introduce you all to the COVID Information Commons, or KIC. We are a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. The KIC brings together scholars from all over the country and around the world to share their research findings in the form of lightning talks. Today, each of our speakers will engage the community directly, answering your questions about their work during a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. I should also note that we at The Kick are committed to providing a supportive and welcoming environment to everyone who works, studies, and interacts with the NEBD Hub community at public events. So we encourage you to review our code of conduct, which I will drop in the, the chat in a second, for all of our online programs. It includes information about uh, conduct reporting and accessibility features. So I'll drop a link to those resources in the chat shortly. This afternoon, I want to also introduce you to another member of the hub on our call. We have Florence Hudson, our executive director, and Lauren Close, who is our operations and communi communications manager, is also a pivotal part of our team, but unfortunately she could not be here today. So now I will hand the um, virtual mic over to Florence to talk a little bit about the kick and the resources throughout. Great, thank you so much, Emily. So uh, thank you for those of you joining us who've been here before, uh, friends we've already met and new friends. And we're very grateful for our presenters today, including uh, researchers, professors, and one of our student researchers who won a previous COVID Information Commons Challenge. So when NSF, the National Science Foundation, contacted us in March of 2020, that pivotal moment, and asked us to create a portal for people to be able to easily find NSF-funded COVID-related research, which were the rapid awards at the time, you know, rapid, rapid in, rapid out when there's a, a national emergency, I went into the, uh, the simple search mechanism at NSF, and there were exactly 32 awards related to COVID in NSF. Today, we have over 13,000 in this COVID information commons. So we had to re-architect a little bit. Um, we created it so that you could easily find COVID-related awards by NSF. We added NIH in our kick extension and also the PIs and their work. We also have a lot of other um, opportunities and resources, including student paper challenges. We have a student working group. Um, we have all of the videos from prior presentations. We have over 100, 140 now, I think, lightning talks. And you can actually uh, view all of them in our video library, as well as read the transcripts in English, Spanish, French, and we're creating them in Hindi now as well. Next slide, please. So we were delighted to have the first award in 2020. And the way rapid awards work is uh, they contacted us in March, we wrote it, uh, submitted it in May, we, we got the money right away and we launched it in July. <laughs> um, and so um, after that, and we were able to successfully bring together a great community of researchers and work on research together, we were talking about how COVID is really a disease and it would be very nice to include NIH awards as well, the National Institutes of Health. And so we were very fortunate that NSF extended our, our KIC award um, and in this KIC extension gave us $2 million more in 2021. So we go through 2025 at this point and we've included all these NIH awards. Next slide, please. So the Kick Extension Award has brought us now to over 13,500 um, NSF and NIH funded grants in this database. All the PI information or principal investigator and researcher information is in there. If you go to the website, you can actually uh, pivot by funder. You could say NSF or NIH, the directorate or institute or center, depending on the funder, the awardee organization, the state or territory, the PI name, uh, the program officer or official um, at the funding agency or the starter end date. So various ways you can query the database to find research of interest to you. 
you can just put um, a name in the search mechanism, the name of a human, uh, you could put epidemiology, you could put digital twins. I'm working on biomedical digital twins now. And so look to see if there are any digital twin related work. Um, and we continue to update the database every month, leveraging the APIs or application programming interface from the NSF and the NIH website. Next slide, please. We also have another cool uh, Research Explorer tool called our Research Explorer Machine Learning Maps tool. And it's available from the main webpage, once again, at covidinfocommons.net. You would just click on ML Maps tool. And that brings you into this machine learning clustering tool that goes against the database and then um, allows you to see clusters of different awards. This has allowed and enabled researchers and students to find multiple people working in specific areas. You can identify the institution they're in, you can identify the PI name, you can look at information about the award um, and then contact them. Here's an example of using that tool and then specifying epidemiology is the query. And you can see there are 367 awards that come up and they're clustered in various ways. So you can identify people doing research in your domain area or in a new domain area you wish to get um, interested in. So all of this is open and online all the time um, and free, uh, as we say, your tax dollars at work. And we're delighted that we have the opportunity to create these tools so people can easily access COVID-related research, because this is going to be with us for a while, and there's still a lot more to figure out. One of the other things we're doing is that um, we've um, published with Springer Nature before on some of our cybersecurity projects, and we are now doing a new book um, on the COVID information commons with the, P the principal investigators who have presented on prior uh, lightning talk webinars that we've done so that they can, they're going to write 10 page chapters on um, the funder for their research, the title, the goal of their research, the results. And then the last part of their chapter is recommendations regarding mitigating future pandemics. Because when they first contacted us about creating this award or creating this project, I tried to find COVID related research, you know, coronavirus research. It was very difficult to find anything. Um, and then I found um, information on like a 1986 biennial coronavirus workshop. It's like, you're kidding, they were doing those? Why can't I find this information? And I think we as researchers, it's very important for us and it should be, it's our responsibility to make our research findable and accessible. And so we're going to be doing that not only through our website, we also archive it to this archive called Dryad that you might be familiar with, but also we're gonna be representing some of it in a Springer book, which we're really excited about, which should be published next year. So that's what the kick is all about. Um, one of the best parts of the kick is the community itself, which all of you are part of by being here today and our researchers as well. So I wanna thank Emily for leading this discussion for us today. Lauren couldn't make it today. She put all this together and we wanna thank her so much for that. Um, and then Emily, I think it's my turn to turn it back to you. Perfect, thank you so much, Florence. So um, quickly before we get into today's presentations, I want to highlight our student working group at the KIC. The student working group has over 650 members from all over the world. It's a really wonderful and international collaboration space for STEM students interested in working together on data science projects related to COVID-19. We have several data science projects for students to participate in. One is a data visualization project, which helps students learn about data science and best practices for communication. Another uses the Oxford University Government Response Tracker dataset to teach students how to identify time series and geospatial trends in global COVID policies. And finally, we have a project which teaches students how to develop a data dashboard for organizing their COVID-19 data. Students can participate asynchronously and will receive a certificate for their completed projects. More information is available on the working group website, which I just dropped in the chat for you all. The next meeting will be Thursday, October 3rd. So please join and encourage your students to join us. We'll be using that session to share research presentations from other KIC student researchers. This fall, we are also launching for the KIC student working group, a new project which teaches data essentials. Using a data set from the CDC on long COVID symptoms, we're encouraging students to build a research project which includes a data dashboard, a written analysis, a visual presentation, and more. 
Students will learn the basics of data science ethics, data cleaning, and hypothesis testing. It should take about 40 hours to complete, and students can work on their own schedule to complete the project for a certificate. We also encourage faculty to consider folding elements of this project into their Intro to Data Science syllabi. This is a great project for students looking for an introduction to data science methodology and for more advanced students who want to better understand the data cleaning and acquisition process. For example, we've had faculty use our other data science projects at the University of Washington Tacoma, so check out our website to learn more. We would also like to offer a big congratulations to the winner of the 2024 Kick Student Paper Challenge. In the undergraduate cohort, Akshaya from Ohio University and Min and Emma from Luther College tied in first place with fascinating research about COVID's effects on economic epidemiology and children's IQ levels. Second place went to Caitlin from UC San Francisco because of their interesting paper about brain fog and long COVID. In third, we have Seng Jun from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who dove deep into socioeconomic and mental health impacts of COVID-19 in Mexico. And in the graduate cohort, our first place went to uh, Kyrol from the University of Virginia for their impressive research on deep learning and how it can help us assess COVID-19 infection data. These student researchers will be presenting their findings on October 3rd, the KIC Student uh, Working Group webinar. So please join us and support student research. But without further ado, I'd now like to introduce the speaker of today's COVID-19 webinar. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from three NSF and NIH funded researchers. If you have any questions for our speakers during their presentations, please feel free to drop them into the chat or hold on to those questions for our Q&A session at the conclusion of the presentations. And so I'd like to kick off this afternoon's webinar by introducing you to Dr. Kristen Funk, based at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Dr. Funk will share her research with us about Alzheimer's disease and neurotropic viral infections. I had my screen up before, now where has it gone? There you go. Okay, sorry, I'm having weirdness happening. Okay, does it look okay? Does it look normal to you now? Or is it in speaker view? This is speaker view. Okay, switch it again. There we go, how about now? Perfect. All right, thank you everybody for being here. I'm excited to tell you about uh, the work that I've been doing in my lab, investigating CD8 T cell immunity in the AIDS brain um, in response to a respiratory coronavirus infection and particularly in um, the context of cognitive impairment. So we've known for a long time that um, advanced age impacts the severity of viral infections. Uh, Viral infections occur in all age groups, but the most severe outcomes disproportionately affect those who are over the age of 60, um, over the age of 60. Um, we've seen this uh, previously. My work has been on the West Nile virus, neuroinvasive disease, and then of course more recently with the coronavirus outbreak. And so we want to understand how age impacts the antiviral immune response um, in the central nervous system. Uh, previously, we looked at West Nile virus, and that was published a couple of years ago. And then more recently, what I'm going to tell you about today was using um, the mouse coronavirus, MHP, which has been posted to BioArchive um, and is currently in revision for publication. So we know that aging broadly affects the immune system. So inflammation is this term that we use to denote this highly inflammatory environment. Um, in particular, we see increased CD8 T cells, but we see a reduction in the naive T cell pool, as well as a reduction in T cell receptor diversity, which we think impacts the ability to uh, respond to new challenges. And so my lab is interested in understanding how that affects the antiviral immune response in the brain and how it might affect uh, post-infectious cognitive recovery. And so in order to study this, uh, my lab uh, has established this model in 
uh, this mouse model using MEP A59, and we uh, inoculate intranasally um, eight week or 18 month old C57 black six male mice with 10 to the third plaque forming units, so 10 to the third uh, infectious units, um, or with HBSS. And then we watch these mice over a period of 30 days. This model is really um, established by Dr. Katie Reagan in my lab, who's a postdoc who uh, left recently. But using this model, we showed that uh, aged mice are more susceptible to lethal viral infection, which was not surprising. They also, um, aged mice experience more severe disease course, so greater weight loss, as well as um, higher clinical scores that we can measure. And so we wanted to understand how this correlated, particularly with the um, cellular immune response in the brain. So we did this by flow cytometry, looking at uh, the CD4 and the CD8 T cells in the brain. So notably, under normal conditions, we have very few to no T cells in the brain, but um, during infection, we see this recruitment of these T cells to the brain. So here we're looking at 12 days post-infection and at 30 days post-infection, we see that aged mice have higher uh, levels of these CD8 T cells in the brain, um, both at 12 and 30 days post-infection. And then we also investigated in the lungs, where is the kind of primary source of infection, as well as cervical lymph nodes, media spinal lymph nodes, and the spleen see these higher levels of T cells kind of across the board in these aged mice. However, when we looked at the viral specificity of these T cells, we saw that a decreased percentage of these T cells in the aged mice are um, specific to this MHV virus that we're infecting them with. Uh, both at, again, both at 12 and 30 days post-infection. And so this is suggesting to us that we have this influx of T cells to the brain, but a lower percentage of them in aged mice are specific to the virus and contributing to that clearing the virus. And so we wanted to understand how that might uh, play out in, uh, in a spatial learning model. So we have previously seen that in our West Nile model, uh, post-infectious mice have these cognitive deficits. Um, and so we've tested that using the Barnes maze that we're kind of depicting here. It's basically a circular table that you put a mouse in the middle here, and then you test them twice each day for five consecutive days. Um, and this target hole is put in the same location every day, and they eventually learn where this target hole is. This is basically just kind of a, a hidey box that the mouse can go in to um, escape this kind of anxiety uh, causing tests that we have them on. And we're doing this at day 25 to day 29 post-infection. So that's about two weeks after virus has cleared from the brain. And so um, during this infect, sorry, during this test, uh, we test them twice each day for five consecutive days. And so that's what we're seeing here. Um, the black dotted line is our mock infected adult mice. And the black solid line is our um, are in MHB infected adult mice. And so you can see that both groups of mice um, improve over that five day time course. We really don't see a significant difference between those mock versus infected groups though. Um, when we look at our mock infected age mice, which is this red dotted line, um, they do improve over that five day period, but there's a little bit of a bump here on that day too. However, when we look at this uh, infected age group, uh, the line is this red, solid line, the line is really totally shifted upward, suggesting a significant uh, spatial learning deficit in the in these mice. And so we can collapse this down uh, basically to one data point using this latency, or sorry, this area under the curve that we've normalized the mocks, so which basically taking this kind of bump that we see in these aged mice, uh, normalizing to that effect. But again, we see um, each of these dots here represents a single mouse that we've tested on this paradigm. We see a significant increase uh, in latency in these adult mice or these aged mice post-infection. Um, and it's particularly on days two, three, and four that we see this, uh, this cognitive decline. And so we wanted to understand the cellular mechanism leading to this effect. And so um, in our West Nile model, we typically have seen that this, or we've seen that this is due to microglial mediated synapse elimination, uh, basically impairing this, um, impairing the, the, the communication between neurons. And demyelination is also known to occur in these MHC models. However, we saw no evidence of either of those things happening in our system. 
Rather, we saw evidence of neuronal death, particularly in the hippocampus, which we know is important for uh, spatial learning that I, I just talked about. And so here I'm showing you, um, these are eight week old mice and then 18 month old, uh, particularly in the CA3 region of the hippocampus that we've seen. Um, in blue is DAPI, in green is new N, which is our neuronal nuclei, and then in red uh, is our tunnel staining, which is indicative of uh, apoptosis. And so we've quantified them each individually. So here's our new N staining and our tunnel staining, and then our co-localization. Um, using Pearson correlation coefficient and Nanders coefficient. And what we see is that, particularly at um, in our mock infected aged animals, we see a little bit of elevated tunnel staining, but at 12 days, we see it elevated in both our 18 month and our eight week old animals. And we can see that co localization is being highlighted by these arrows in each of these groups. And so uh, we see that elevated at this acute time frame for both ages, and then it seems to recover in both age groups, although it remains a little bit elevated in these um, in the age group. And so this suggesting that we're having this uh, this cognitive decline is likely mediated by this neuronal death within this uh, trisynaptic circuit that we know is important for spatial learning. And so we wanted to understand kind of a cellular mechanism causing this neuronal apoptosis. And so we established a co-culture system in which we took primary neurons from mice and we left them um, either uninfected or we infected them with MHVA59. And so we learned, we did that on its own. Um, again, we're staying with new N in green and tunnel is in red um, and then co-localization is highlighted in this yellow by these um, arrows. Um, the, the virus on its own didn't really seem to kill the neuron. However, when we co-cultured them with CD8 T cells that had been isolated from MHD infected mice at seven days post-infection, now we see this much um, stronger co-localization in which we're seeing neuronal death, suggesting that the virus on its own didn't kill our neurons, but the T cells from these infected mice did. And so we wanted to know whether this was an antigen-specific response or um, antigen independent. And so we again took our co-culture system of uninfected neurons or infected neurons and cultured them um, either alone or co-cultured them with um, naive CD8 T cells. So these are from um, an uninfected mouse or T cells that had been bulk stimulated with PMA and ionomycin. And then again, we're staining with new N and tunnel. Uh, and I think we can appreciate that the DNA and ionomycin uh, bulk stimulated T cells uh, cause reduced neuronal nuclei staining and increased tunnel staining co-localization. So this is suggesting to us that um, it's not necessarily an antigen specific response, it's more just these activated T cells are likely causing this neuronal death phenotype. And so we think that's important in that age group in particular, which had that um, infiltration of those T cells that were not necessarily antigen specific or not um, specific to our virus. And so um, with that, just my conclusions that we think that viral infections are causing uh, death to these neurons via this CD8 T cell response. And we're trying to understand more about this uh, mechanism mediating this response. We're also interested in the progression of effector T cells in the memory T cells um, and what factors may be uh, influencing that during aging and then how viral infections or T cells may promote AD-related pathology, including tau pathology, as well as genotoxic stress. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank the people who uh, did this work, particularly Katie Reagan. Um, and if you're interested, here's that link to that bioarchive submission. And so that's what I've got. Thank you so much, Dr. Funk. That was very interesting. Um, and I'm sure most others in the uh, the audience are thinking the same as I am. So please drop your questions that you have for Dr. Funk into the chat or save them to ask them live at the end uh, during our live Q&A session. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. John Yin, a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Yin first presented his research to the KIC at a webinar in December 2020, so this is a much anticipated update on his project. Dr. Yin, the floor is yours. Great, thanks a lot uh, to uh, the uh, COVID Information Commons, uh, building the community. I'm happy to have an opportunity to 
share a little bit of our interests. Um, I think of this as a broad community that includes not only scientists, but uh, social scientists. So I've tried to put together a talk that will be understandable by all. all. The title is changed a little bit. Rather than ecological dynamics, I will focus on evolutionary dynamics of human coronaviruses and what one might be able to learn uh, from such processes that might actually inform how we think about new strategies for preventing future pandemics. So COVID-19 persists. Okay, this uh, is a little bit out of date, but this is from August uh, 2024. So last month where there have been um, uh, over 7 million deaths globally. And um, at that time, there was some increase over the previous seven days. So people continue to be infected. And the cases also, at least in, in August uh, last month, they were increasing over the last uh, 28 days or so. So the numbers are certainly much lower than they were at the height of the pandemic. But we know uh, people are still getting infected. And we don't know what will be happening uh, during the, the coming uh, months or years. So why does it persist? Well, basically, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, continues to evolve. And I won't go into details. This was nicely reviewed in uh, last year. Essentially, if you look at this um, figure from uh, a timeline from uh, January 2020 out to December 2022, you see a bunch of different colors uh, appearing and disappearing uh, that are correlated with various strains of the virus. Uh, isolated from patients over this period. And essentially the virus is uh, being displaced. Various strains are being displaced by new strains that are uh, continuing to evolve. So uh, it persists because it evolves. And of course, we know that we have each gotten, uh, hopefully, uh, vaccinated at least once and in many cases, multiple times to protect ourselves. But we're be being protected against current or past strains and not necessarily future strains. Likewise, there are drugs that uh, have been developed to target specific virus functions, as well as um, uh, antibody uh, types of therapies. But again, these are targeting uh, uh, viruses as they've existed in the lab have been uh, demonstrated, but ha uh, can give rise to resistant viruses. So to better understand what's going on in these sorts of systems, I thought I'd just go back to some basic virology and uh, share a famous quote from some immunologists that a virus is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein, where the bad news is the genome shown here schematically as this linear entity with various genes. Uh, that's the uh, genome for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused the pandemic. And when we say it's wrapped up in protein, then this genome is, um, is put into a nanoparticle, and the, the, the surface of this particle are the various spike proteins that the virus uses to enter cells. So um, this, uh, the, this particle then, when it encounters a susceptible uh, cell, whether it's in the brain or in the respiratory tract, uh, sends the bad news into the cell, and that bad news gets amplified into something we might call followers for the biologists. These are a message of the virus and proteins, and the followers of this bad news amplify the bad news, make more of it. They also package the bad news and make new virus particles, which are then released into the uh, to the world, uh, external world of the cell, and they can go and infect other cells. Uh, the news is bad because generally the cell that receives the bad news dies in this process of transforming a single virus into anywhere from 10 to 10,000 virus particles. So this is how bad news spreads. A byproduct of this process that is not widely appreciated is that uh, the bad news can also make what we could call fake news. So in addition to amplifying the bad news during a normal infection, a byproduct of this process is to make genomes that are defective, that are lacking essential information needed for replication. We call these genomes defective virus genomes, or in this case, fake news. They can also be packaged into particles, and we call them zombie uh, virus particles. So in this case, a zombie virus particle is a piece of fake news wrapped up in protein. 
it's a byproduct of normal virus infection. Such particles have been known for over 50 years for virtually every virus, including coronaviruses, influenza viruses, dengue viruses, the list goes on and on. Why do we call them zombie viruses? Well, we know zombies are dead. And this is no exception. The zombie virus, when it encounters a cell, can release its fake news genome into the cell. But because it is lacking essential information for growth, it fails to turn the cell into a virus factory. In, generally, in general, the cell will not die. And this is the end of the line for this zombie virus. But I've chosen the term zombie virus, which you will not find in the broader literature other than a scientific American perspective article uh, that I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, zombies we know can spring to life and this zombie virus can spring to life under special conditions. And that's in the case that the zombie virus encounters a cell that is infected by a intact virus. So the intact virus goes about its normal process of introducing the bad news, amplifying the bad news, making the followers. But what happens here is if the fake news is introduced by the zombie virus, the fake news can divert the resources of the normal virus infection toward its own amplification and the fake news can get amplified. Likewise, if the fake news re re retains the signals that say, hey, package me, then the fake news can be packaged into zombie virus particles. So what happens is one can get zombie virus reproducing at the expense of a normal virus. And again, this has been known for many viruses for many years. If you look at this figure and you forget about the zombie viruses and just look at the intact virus, you'll notice that one virus goes in and maybe a smaller number of viruses, intact viruses are produced, which is exactly the sort of um, behavior we would like to have for antiviral strategies, uh, therapeutics that reduce or inhibit normal virus growth. So this, is, uh, this idea has inspired many people to, to ask, could we create zombie viruses that are therapeutic? And a number of uh, groups have done that. Uh, these are not my own group, but zombie viruses have inspired the um, engineering of so-called therapeutic interfering particles. So uh, virus-like particles that can divert resources from the virus toward their own replication. Uh, those are a couple of prominent papers from uh, a couple of years ago. So um, I'd like to, I'll return to the zombie viruses, but I want to um, uh, show a special uh, case where uh, people were looking at SARS-CoV-2 evolution in Germany. And what I show here is a single patient at the center of here. I'm not sure, are you able to see my pointer or not? Yes, okay. So here's one patient who was in Freiburg, Germany, who was infected with SARS-CoV-2. We had a swab sample. This is from the paper that published uh, this work. They swabbed the, the person and they got the genetic sequence. And then they also tracked other people who were infected in Freiburg. And each one of these other dots represents another person in Freiburg who was uh, infected by a virus related to the initial one. And based on their swab samples and the sequence analyses, one can create this, uh, an, uh, this trajectory of evolution. So each of these individual dots are uh, swab sample sequences that are showing the further, or, uh, the further away you go from the center, the more evolutionary diversity, um, uh, genetic diversity you have on these uh, viruses. So this is showing evolution of the virus in Freiburg, Germany uh, during the early pandemic, 2020 or so. Each one of these dots is a single patient, single swab sample. What I now show is an additional evolution beyond that individual where there are additional swab samples were taken and in the red box, there are more uh, radiating outwards, so greater evolution. But what's unusual about this is this was from, from a single person and that person was immunocompromised. If you're getting your organ transplant, you'll get drugs to treat your, um, to downregulate or inhibit your immune response. So you don't reject the organ. 
or if you're HIV positive, then your uh, the the uh, T cells that we heard in the first talk are going to be compromised, and they will be less able to fight the infection that you have, and you might be actually sick for several months or even over a year with your uh, virus infection. So this individual was sick for 120 uh, 140 days. And then uh, swab samples from this single individual indicated that the virus was evolving. It's hypothesized that such immunosuppressed individuals are sources for the uh, genetic diversity that we see uh, as uh, the um, coronavirus evolves. So when we saw this, we've spent a number of years looking at um, defective virus genomes, and we wondered whether or not uh, they might uh, actually be present in COVID patients, and particularly in the uh, 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 immunocompromised patients. So this immunocompromised patient, this is from the published work uh, from day zero to day 140. So this axis is time going from early to late, uh, 140 days. And then the, y uh, the x axis are various virus uh, variants and they're, the higher the level they are, the darker the color. So there are a number of columns here. Uh, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or so columns where the, the strain that was uh, present at day zero persisted all the way through. So that the, these are the vertical col columns here. But you will also see indications where new dots appear and disappear or persist over time. And these represent genetic variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So they are evolving in this particular patient. We went into the database for this particular patient and looked for specifically signs that maybe there could be some zombie viruses, so defective virus genomes that delete large sections of information. This is work of my PhD student, Nan Jiang, who uh, needed to learn the informatics from a collaborator, uh, Colin Dewey, but uh, eventually was able to create an analogous uh, plot. So here's day zero through day 140. And here are also various changes that are occurring. And all the x-axis represent various deletions uh, uh, um, that are uh, appearing and disappearing or persisting uh, over the course of uh, this immunocompromised patient's uh, infection. So we don't know what this really means yet, other than there's something that seems to be tagging along with the normal virus. There's evidence of these zombie-like virus, and they may, might be co-evolving. One, per, one perspective might be, we know that if you test positive for COVID, that your symptoms can range from, non, from asymptomatic or non-severe all the way to critical. And one perspective might be that if zombie viruses are prevalent at higher concentrations, then maybe they're inhibiting the normal virus and you're having a less severe disease. Whereas if you are testing positive and you have very little zombie virus, maybe they are not inhibiting the virus so well, so you're getting a more cr critical uh, kind of severity of disease. This is one hypothesis. But we've also looked at other immunocompromised patients as well as uh, patients who are um, under surveillance. We've looked at their zombie virus, uh, the defective virus genome frequencies, and uh, basically we've seen in some cases patients recover, the frequencies are a bit lower. Uh, in one case, so this is an N of one, uh, a patient died, a patient from the United Kingdom who was immunocompromised, and they happen to have higher levels of defective virus genome frequencies. Uh, so um, this at least shows that it's possible that they could be perhaps not protective, but maybe could be correlated with more severe disease. We don't know what uh, what uh, this really means at this point, but um, this opens a number of questions. So one is how are virus-like genomes or these defective virus genomes, how are the zombie viruses uh, linked to disease severity? We've suggested they could be causing more severe disease or less severe disease. We'd like to better understand how these defective virus genomes or zombie viruses function. How do they interact with the resources of the normal infected cell or during co-infections? How do they activate immune responses, either innate or adaptive immune responses? Ultimately, are there design rules that we could uh, uh, figure out from studying these beneficial defective virus genomes? So I've hinted towards the idea that they might be 
helping us provide, um, prevent future pandemics. We have currently drugs and vaccines that interfere with normal virus growth and activate protective immune responses. And a claim here is that these therapeutic interfering particles can do the same, but they also offer additional possibilities. One is that they amplify by preying on infected cells. Currently, there are no drugs or vaccines that amplify themselves in the presence of the disease. So that's potential interesting feature of therapeutic interfering particles. Therapeutic interfering particles, since they are virus-like, can also transmit between hosts just like viruses do. So currently, drugs and vaccines do not transmit between hosts. So if you're an anti-vaxxer, it's conceivable that you could receive protection from someone who has been inoculated with a therapeutic interfering particle. Therapeutic interfering particles also have the possibility of resisting virus escape. Viruses escape current vaccines and drugs because they create genetic variation that can allow them to resist uh, the effects of drugs. But therapeutic interfering particles use the same error-prone machinery that the virus uses. So they have the possibility of co-evolving with the virus. And there is actually work uh, very old work that we are working to reproduce in which therapeutic interfering particles and viruses can be co-evolving. So if we think about the powerful new features of therapeutic interfering particles, we have to also recognize that there will be new risks and this opens new ethical questions. So I think it's important for us to be aware of these sorts of questions that also arise. I have a number of uh, great collaborators. I just want to uh, highlight here, in particular, Colin Dewey from Biostatistics and Medical Informatics, who's played a central role in, uh, in uh, helping and my graduate student come up to speed on the bioinformatics. We also have people in the medical school and people working with immunocompromised hamsters and evolutionary biologists who are helping us. So that concludes my talk. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Feel free to take a look at our website or contact me uh, if I'm not able to get your questions uh, during today's session. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Ian. That was incredibly interesting as well. Um, thank you for sharing that research with us. We are going to now introduce our final speaker of the day, Dinesh Boja, a student at Yale University. Dinesh is an undergraduate research fellow at Yale, where he worked with Dr. Jeffrey Townsend, one of our other former KIC webinar speakers. Dinesh is going to be talking about his research on quarantine and international travel, work that he did as a part of the 2023 KIC student paper challenge. Dinesh, we're so excited to hear your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Dinesh Boja. I'm an undergraduate student at Yale University, and today, I'm happy to be presenting my project, Sufficient COVID-19 Quarantine and Testing on International Travelers from China. As mentioned before, I've been working on this project with the Townsend Laboratory at the Yale School of Public Health, and I'm excited to be presenting it with all today. As I'm sure we're all aware, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has left a lasting impact on our global society. As of September, there have been over 776 million cases of COVID-19 that have been reported with the true prevalence of infection potentially being even higher, with many cases not being reported by any government agencies. One particular response to the COVID-19 pandemic that was really particularly interesting was in China, where they used what was called the zero COVID policy. The zero COVID policy was meant to mitigate the effects of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic using strict lockdowns, contact tracing, and mass testing of all Chinese citizens. And while China did report fewer cases in other nations using this policy due to food shortages, economic damage, and social strain, many Chinese citizens were discontent with the rollout and started protesting. As such, in December 2022, China completely repealed all of the policies regarding zero COVID, leading the country back to where it was before. However, many scientific journals and news outlets began to question whether this was the right move, suggesting that potentially by repealing the zero COVID policy, China had but maybe caused more damage than it did before. And accordingly, in December 2022 and January 2023, China had seen hundreds of millions of cases of COVID-19. With fear that this increase of infection within China would translate to an increase of infection within their own borders, many foreign countries imposed harsh travel restrictions on Chinese travelers, requiring testing, quarantining, and even banning Chinese travelers altogether. 
However, we wanted to determine whether this strict quarantine was actually necessary for some of these countries, which may already have a high prevalence of infection within their own borders. To analyze this, we use what was called the sufficient quarantine model. The sufficient quarantine model aims to find this optimal quarantine, and we define the optimal quarantine as a minimum duration such that the number of infections with travel and without travel are completely equalized. This model, developed in my lab in a paper published by Wells et al., defines a more quantitative public health modeling method to determine what this optimal quarantine should be, rather than justifying quarantines through political, social, and economic means. So to break down what this model really looks at, it takes a country, for example, some origin country B, and looks at a destination country A, and wants to see what quarantine that country A should place on travelers from country B, so that the number of infections within the destination country, country A, if you can see my mouse, will make sure that there's no increase of infection with travel, not necessarily to mitigate the most infections possible. And we start defining where these infections are coming from, whether they're coming from people who live in country A, from travelers from country B coming into this destination, or from travelers mixing between the two countries overall. And by determining where these infections are coming from and determining what quarantines would have what effects on which specific cases, we're able to find a graph like this. This model provides us on the x-axis, the quarantine duration, and the y-axis, the imminent of infections, or the number of new infections per day in the destination. This graph particularly looks at Italy and, and what would happen if it placed quarantine on Chinese travelers, which we'll get into a little bit more later on the country specifics. But what this model really shows us is what the effect of such a quarantine would be on different nations. Importantly, this red line, horizontal, represents the number of infections in a country at baseline, if there was no travel whatsoever. It makes sense that this line is horizontal, as an increase in quarantine duration with no travel would really have no effect on the imminent infections. But the rest of the lines represent some sort of testing regimen, using RT-PCR, rapid antigen, or no testing whatsoever, and have a decreasing trend, which also makes sense as an increased quarantine duration would mean that all the individuals who are in quarantine would be cured of their disease and would go into the country and one, transmit fewer infections, and two, have natural immunity, which would increase kind of that herd immunity idea and decrease the susceptible population. In essence, what we're looking for in this type of graph is where these testing regimens intersect with this horizontal red line. In this specific case, this intersects at 10 days and tells us that a sufficient quarantine would be about 10 days for Italy against Chinese travelers. Any stricter, then Italy would be placing too strict of a quarantine, wasting resources that could be used in more beneficial methods. And any less strict, then we, they would potentially be increasing the number of infections within their own borders. Now that we understand how this model works, we can look, to what these, uh, we can look at what type of data we really need for this. And frankly, it's pretty simple and able to be done by pretty much anyone. All that's necessary is the vaccination rate, the total population, immunity level, prevalence, and the travel between the countries. And with this simple data, we're able to find out what the sufficient quarantine would be for different countries. So we specifically focused on China after the zero COVID policy was repealed and looking at the, uh, the week of February 12th in um, 2024. And we can see that both looking at European countries and East Asian countries, the minimum sufficient quarantine varies significantly. Looking at England, we see that some countries like Scotland, England, and Germany require a low uh, sufficient quarantine to prevent an increase of infection, while countries like France and Italy require a much stricter quarantine. Similarly, we can see a trend with Japan, Singapore, and South Korea requiring even no days of quarantine uh, to prevent an increase of infection, while Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines require a strict quarantine. This really shows that geographic location doesn't have as much of an effect as we thought with regards to the increase in quarantine, and rather, it's a lot more based on the specific statistics that we'll go into more detail soon. We are able to also bring this, uh, these graphical data into a table format, which makes it easier to see what this intersection looks like. So we are able to stratify between what the different testing regimens are, whether we're using no test, an RT-PCR, rapid antigen on exit, or rapid, rapid antigen test on entry and exit and also split between how we're getting this prevalence data for China specifically, whether we're using the World Health Organization or self-reported data, a really important characteristic that we'll get into when we start talking about the implications. We can see that with the self-reported data, there's, there's a suggested higher quarantine than with the World Health Organization data. And additionally, all these different testing regimens seem to have a slightly different suggested quarantine, recognizing that different countries need to recognize what type of regimen they're putting 
on different travelers in order to make the best public health decision they can for their constituents. We see a similar trend here with some of these countries, for example, Vietnam and Thailand, having different suggested quarantines depending on the type of testing regimen that they're using. Now, the important thing about this model is not just what the quarantine that it suggests are, but also the implications it has on policy and what type of characteristics are really important for us to look at both for this pandemic and for future upcoming pandemics so we're able to make a really educated and informed decision moving forward. By far the most important characteristic on determining the minimum sufficient quarantine are gonna be travel metrics. The volume of travelers, how long they're staying, and how many people are traveling in, um, as a whole. Countries with a really high rate of travel, like Vietnam and the Philippines, are obviously gonna be needing a much harsher quarantine, which is why they even suggest no travel whatsoever. This is because there's just such a high volume of people coming in, they need to protect their constituents by having a stricter quarantine. Whereas countries with fewer people traveling like Scotland, they don't need as strict of a quarantine because there's just such a small volume overall. Prevalence of infection within the destination country also has a really strong impact as a high prevalence in the destination actually means that they need a lower quarantine. This is because for example, in Japan or South Korea, considering they have so many people who already are infected, any new infections coming in is like a drop in the bucket. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. And finally, vaccination rate doesn't have as much of an effect as we expected um, originally and could potentially even have a counterbalancing effect. A softer quarantine could be necessary with a high vaccination rate because, well, there's going to be more people who have immunity within destination country, but also could necessitate a stricter quarantine because if the destination has, per se, 100% vaccination, any incoming travelers could actually increase the susceptibility rate by introducing people who don't have this immunity. So there's this counterbalancing force that makes it really important for us to have a quantitative method to determine what the sufficient quarantine should be, rather than kind of going off of this political or social methodology. And second, as we kind of alluded to earlier in this presentation, it's important for us to have accurate and timely data to make effective public health interventions. There were some reports that suggested that the World Health Organization's statistics for prevalence of COVID in China may not have been representative of the true infection rate. The World Health Organization statistics suggested a prevalence of about 0.006%, which is significantly low considering that China was the epicenter of the COVID pandemic and many citizens within the country had reported having a lot more COVID than was suggested. One specific article by Novazi et al. suggested that the prevalence might be as high as 22.7%, looking at Chinese travelers to flights in Milan. We opted to use a middle ground estimate from a paper by Fu et al, which looked at self-reported infections by Chinese citizens, which gave a prevalence of about 0.1%. Now, when we look at this tip of different data, looking at the World Health Organization versus the self-reported metric, we see that there's a significant change in the suggested quarantine. For Scotland, for example, with an RT-PCR, the World Health Organization suggestion gives about zero days of quarantine, whereas the self-reported data suggests three full days. This means that countries need to have accurate and timely data so they can make a strong public health decision, or else they might be inviting more infection than they would have otherwise, or might be making too um, incorrect of a judgment call. Without this accurate data, countries really have no bearings on what type of public health intervention is necessary for them. And finally, the minimum sufficient quarantine model really provides a helpful tool, not only for this pandemic, but for future pandemics as well. It's very easy to use and is able to help use um, all the data that different individuals have from the government level to the citizen level to determine what type of quarantine is actually necessary. It can be adapted to future pandemics as well and for different pairs of countries, making it truly versatile and, use and usable in a prophylactic setting as well. The model is by nature very conservative, suggesting the strictest possible quarantine that a country could possibly need to prevent an increase of infection specifically due to travel so that any other resources that could be used in this quarantine could instead be used in better methods, like case finding and tracing, so that countries are able to best allocate their resources overall. Thank you again for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Nash, wonderful job. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I got to hear your research the first time. It was incredibly interesting. It's the same, even maybe more so interesting now getting to hear it the second time. You always do such a great job. Thank you for joining today. Um, for our audience, let me share this with you quickly as you all are dropping your questions for Dinesh, for Dr. Yin and Dr. Funk in the chat. Um, 
Each of our speakers' presentations will be made available on our website and on our YouTube channel later this week. Written transcripts in English, Spanish, French, and now Hindi, as Florence mentioned earlier in the call. Um, the transcripts will be generated by our students in the coming weeks as part of our accessibility and multilingual resources initiatives. You can find copies of all of our previous lightning talks. We now have over 140, um, just like the ones that we heard today on our website via the link I'm just about to share in the chat for you all. And before we segue into the Q&A session of today's webinar, I'd also like to briefly highlight all of the ways that you can stay in touch with the COVID Information Commons. Please check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter, or join our student working group. If you have any questions or suggestions for our future events, you can always email us at info at covidinfocommons.net. I will share all of these links in the chat in just a second so you can peruse our channels at your own pace. And keep an eye out for communications from us about upcoming events and activities. So now that I've done all of this admin, I'd like to again pass the virtual mic over to Florence, the executive director of the Hub, to moderate today's Q&A session. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to all the presenters. Excellent job. Um, and I'd like to have Miranda ask her question first if she's able to chat. Miranda, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I kind of piled a couple of questions into the chat there. Um, and this was for uh, Dr. Yin, that was some wonderful work. Um, I was wondering about, so you had some information about the percentage of those defective viral sequences. Can you drill down enough into, I mean, does the sequence information provide a way of looking at any sort of subclustering about whether certain types of defects are more present than others um, amongst the, the ones that are defective? Yeah, the, the big caution here is that anything we say quantitatively has to be taken with a big grain of salt because mm -hmm. we haven't done uh, quantitative standards uh, on, on the defective virus genomes relative to the fully intact ones. That said, we can look at what uh, prevalence there are of particular defective virus genomes rather, uh, relative to the full length uh, based on the sequencing. And there do, does seem to be uh, a, a wide range that we can uh, detect. Um, what that means for the biology, I think, is still wide open. I think you had a question about the fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And in, in, this, um, in, in this particular patient, uh, this was a patient who was uh, undergoing lots of treatments during this period. Right. So, drugs, so that might have influenced. You know, yeah. The... So there, there could be any number of um, uh, uh, other things going on that are not related to the dynamics of the the zombie relative to the to the virus uh, to the intact virus. But I should that mention sense. that in, in controlled culture conditions one can find these kinds of oscillations. It's re really a predator-prey kind of behavior where the zombie is a predator, you know, foxes and rabbits. So yeah. uh, the zombie yeah. is a predator and the productively infected cell is a prey. So those can oscillate uh, over time in, in the cleanest sorts of uh, mathematical models of these systems. And there might be some aspect of that uh, in nature, but uh, really needs to be more quantitative before we can say anything on that. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the questions, Miranda. Fascinating work, and I love listening to all these brilliant people discuss these things and make things better for the future. And John actually is one of our authors, I believe, in the Kick book. He's going to be providing a, um, a chapter on his research, um, the goals, the results, and the recommendation for mitigation of future pandemics. So we really look forward to getting that published next year. So thank you, John, for being part of that too. Thanks for editing the volume, uh, Florence. My pleasure. Yeah, 30 PIs, 120 authors. It's a lot of fun, <laughs> but it's really worth it. You know, I feel like it's our responsibility as researchers doing all this work to share it for, for posterity. Um, and then Kristen, you had a question for Dinesh, I believe. Would you like to ask it aloud? Sure. Um, I was thinking about, you know, as we think about these new variants that can, you know, we have different levels of infectivity and might be different between um, different countries that you're looking at, if there's a way for you to, or if you have any way to incorporate um, 
kind of those distinctions between the countries. It, it seems to me like you're basically treating all infections between countries the same. I guess I'm wondering if that's uh, if you've considered or if there's a way to incorporate these kind of different variants that you see between countries. For sure. That's a really good question and something that we really wanted to address considering when we're looking at COVID, like it was very evident there's so many variants spiraling around. So in the original model that we had developed, um, published in the Wells et al. paper um, that I can send in the chat later on, we did take into consideration like what the different variants would look like when we're looking at the transmission rate of infection between these different individuals. So if we're looking at, for example, I kind of showed that graph within like people are moving from country A to country B. When we're looking at this transmission rate, we're able to incorporate like not only is there going to be this main variant of concern or like maybe a couple of variants specifically, but also consider what would happen if there were, were, were new variants that were also um, into consideration. But what's also really nice about the model is if the reproductive number or some something specific is really novel about either this variant or if we want to look at a completely different disease, we can really easily update the, the model, the sufficient quarantine model, in order to determine what this new quarantine should be. Um, so yeah, I think it's what's nice about the model is it helps quantify this quarantine that's necessary to prevent new variants or anything from entering a nation and kind of take into consideration like the fact that there may be more than one thing spiraling around. But yeah, thank you for the question. Very good, thank you. And so Dinesh, you have me thinking, is your model going to be open source? <laughs> you know, do you plan on making it available and how do you plan on communicating it? Uh, you know, there maybe there's something we could do. And I know uh, Jeffrey Townsend was on the line as well and he's worked with us a whole bunch at the hub and the kick. Um, you know, so what are your plans for that? For sure, well, Dr. Townsend and I have, um, I mean, I've been working with this uh, with Townsend since uh, my freshman year, and it's been a great pleasure. This project for now has been completely open source. Like anyone can open up the project and it describes in full detail all of the math that's behind it, like how we did all the calculations and as well has all the data and everything in a lovely Excel file. So anyone can open it up, plug in the parameters that they know, like those, like the population, um, vaccination rate, everything I kind of discussed, and it gives them an estimate. So if anyone wants to look at the data, um, kind of try out their own information, they can feel free to do so. We also published this, um, this specific project on the Zero COVID um, project, where I also wrote down exactly how I got all of my data. So anyone can look through, kind of see how they can collect their own information to inform future policy decisions as well. So our goal is to really make this as open and free as possible because of how important it could be for future policy. Very interesting. You know, well, we're very fortunate at the hub. Um, we have a pretty broad platform to communicate with people and the kick. Um, and the, the Northeast Big Data Hub now has over 11,600 individuals that work with us around the planet. And we have our newsletters. We also have the Kick Student Working Group and they do a new project every semester. I'm wondering if leveraging your model would be not just interesting, but inspiring for them you know, that it was created by a student. Um, so maybe that's something we can, you know, connect with you on and look at possibilities for leveraging it into the future, not overburdening you while you're trying to get a degree at Yale and you're doing all this research and you have enough going on for goodness sake. Um, but, you know, maybe there's a way that we could leverage it even further and give you a broader platform for broader impact, as they say, for the awards, right, Jeffrey? <laughs> Dinesh, what do you think about that? Is that overwhelming or could we- oh, Sorry, no, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, so that sounds great. I will say with full transparency, this um, a lot of the credit for this model does go to the Townsend Laboratory and everyone else who's been involved in this project. So thank you both to, I know Dr. Townsend's on here for everyone for helping me make this a reality. And I think it would be great. Hope I think that sounds very fruitful. Great. Yeah. And uh, we're all about, you know, data science and team science. We always try to teach people that it's a team effort. It's interesting. We we actually had a data science project that some students got involved in, and they said to us they'd never done data science as a team. I'm like, oh, no. You know, so we did. I know. <laughs> so we're like, oh, my gosh, yes, it's a team sport, please. Um, so it's wonderful that you want to make clear, you know, all the different people and the different perspectives. And we teach that a lot too. And we look at, you know, bias and ethics regarding our science and how we look at different things, whether it's the, you know, the gender we have or some other aspect of us or whatever it is, having everybody's point of view is very important. So all these messages sound wonderful. So, ooh, Emily, we're going to get to work with uh, with Dinesh on this and, and Lauren um, when in the future. So thank you very much. That's wonderful. 
I wonder if I could ask Kristen a question. Absolutely. Yeah, so Kristen, a really beautiful talk there, and I found the uh, cognitive test really interesting, uh, the way you are able to quantify uh, when uh, when the mice are not doing cognitively as well. But I, I was just curious on the um, MHV, to what extent that virus versus SARS-CoV-2, the similarities and differences, and to what extent uh, one can you know, translate results from MHV versus SARS-CoV-2 to maybe what might be happening in humans. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a question that we've gotten. Um, so it is, it's a, MHV is a beta coronavirus. So it's in kind of the same clade of SARS-CoV-2. It's probably more similar to like OC43 and the HKU coronavirus than SARS-1, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so there's been, I know there's been debate over whether or not SARS-CoV-2 actually gets into the brain. And there's some studies that say it does get into the brain. Some studies kind of say that it doesn't. So that's a point of question, right? Um, all, we do see this um, MHV strain does get into the brain. So we get primary infection in the lungs and then it does go to the brain. So there is potentially a difference in that. Um, I think one thing that is really important is that we are using a natural model. So it's a natural mouth pathogen. And so we're taking that as every model system has its pros and cons, especially when we're looking at SARS-CoV-2 where um, you know, the virus just doesn't affect doesn't infect mice unless it undergoes this adaptation, which is then changing the virus. So I think every model has its caveats. And so we're choosing to use this mouse, mouse pathogen. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting, I think probably is one of our strongest conclusions is that it's not necessarily, it's, it's really the T cells that seem to be causing the damage rather than the virus itself. And so I think any time that those T cells are getting into the brain, they're probably going to be causing damage kind of irrespective of which virus it is. And so I think that's a one of our strongest conclusions and maybe one of the scarier ones as well. Yeah, your point, is, yeah. your point is well taken and it's just, you know, it's a caveat of the model and trying to understand the pros and cons of all of them. Okay. I wonder if you would relate this to the more severe COVID, which um, people call a cytokine storm, or the you know inflammatory responses. Are are there analogous situations with the MHV or the mice, or uh, is it mainly that you've been studying, focusing more on the cognitive effects? We have been we've been looking really at the immune response, so the cellular immune response. Um, we haven't looked as much into the cytokine storm, but it is probably kind of a similar idea that this is gonna be more of those severe coronavirus infections. It's probably less, you know, less of the less severe coronavirus infections. And, Good, yeah. okay, thanks a lot, yeah. yeah. Excellent, and I think Miranda had a follow-up question in, in the, the chat. This, this is just my, I don't really understand uh, viral infection in terms of where it goes. Um, I mean, I know the primary sort of uh, tissues that are getting infected are in the in the airways. Um, is, does the actual viral particle cross the blood-brain barrier? Do we have evidence of that? I mean, so, and, and not necessarily just in coronavirus, but, you know, do we know in general for things like, say, you know, uh, HIV or those types of viruses? Um, it depends on the virus, and that's kind of yeah. the, the the short answer. Is it depends on the virus. So I'll say West Nile virus, which is what my kind of background is in. Um, definitely can virus can get into the brain, so it can be can become neurotrophic neuroinvasive, and that's when the actual virus gets into the brain, and and it seems to infect neurons and uh, replicate there, and so that causes a lot of damage. Um, with SARS-CoV-2, there is evidence, like basically we can see viral genome in, in the brain. And so mm -hmm. that's, we think that that's probably highly damaging as well. It's less clear that whether, like how common that is in SARS-CoV-2 patients um, of the virus actually getting into the brain, whether or not that replicating virus versus just viral genome, and that's what they're detecting is mostly viral genome is a question. Um, also kind of like is 
basically once um, once you have an infection going on, you have this inflammation happening, your blood brain barrier kind of opens and whether that's a secondary effect versus a primary effect is also a kind of, there's, there's a lot of questions, but. Sure, it's the, a complicated the, system. It's a complicated system. And um, yeah, so we think that virus, it def, I think it happens more than we would like to, more than we appreciate right now. It's, it would be kind of my answer. Great, thank you. Very interesting. Um, yes. And then, John, um, another question that we had regarding uh, your research, um, when you were um, talking about how the COVID symptoms, you know, can can exist for many months in an elder patient or maybe immunocompromised or or something like that. And so does that mean they're still able to transmit the virus for months, even though we say, oh, like three to five days is fine now, and then you can go out. So is that actually a bad idea, uh, depending on the host? Is what the bad idea? That um, that we have these contracted um, quarantine times now, because you know if we say three to five days is fine, and then you can go out. If for some of these patients they have symptoms for many months, does that mean that it they could actually you know give it to other people for many months? You know, should their I think it's very plausible if you're if if you're still testing positive. Um, uh, the virus is uh, not decaying. Uh, the virus might well be replicating. Uh, at least the change in the genetic changes that one sees suggests that it's replicating quite readily. I think it's very plausible that you could be spreading the virus. And one thought is that the immunocompromised patients might be generating this virus diversity and sharing it with their local environments. So, so um, I, I think uh, that that is a concern. Okay, I agree with you. Those were the questions we had here. <laughs> and that was the other one that we had. So like, they're giving this to other people. They're evolving it on their own. You don't have to go to another country. You can evolve it on your own and then infect other people, which is terrible. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that is a possibility. Not that that's good news, but um, I'm glad we're under uh, that we're finding these things out and we're doing research to bring light to it. And I just wanted to share that I'm very involved in the biomedical digital twins work that NIH, NCI, and DOE are doing. And so we're going to be uh, continuing that. We just had a summit in New York. Um, we had the results from last year's virtual human global summit <laughs> um, where we talked about some of the opportunities. And we actually talked about creating something like a COVID information commons, but making it a biomedical digital twins information commons where you can find the research, you can find the researchers, you could do lightning talks, do student challenges. And we just discussed that again um, in Manhattan last week. Um, and so I'm going to look to see how much we can integrate these things together and then look at the use of biomedical digital twins to test some of these things. Well, I put in a couple proposals to the digital twins opportunities. So uh, if those are successful, you might have to put up with me even more. Wonderful. I'm so excited <laughs> to hear that. I love working with smart people. <laughs> so, And all of you are. So this has really been fascinating. I learn so much every time we have these discussions. Um, and Dinesh, as a student, it's wonderful you were able to join us. We give you so much credit for doing this research. Um, we try to help students learn how to do research on their own. I mean, sometimes we teach them, you know, in the scientific way, like, here's the question, go answer it. And then we say, come up with a question. They go, oh, what's the question? We're like, go figure it out. Come up with a question. Look at it and see, see what you think, you know. And we find that sometimes that's a little bit of a speed bump for students. So we give you a lot of credit for doing that. And you're a real role model by doing that. And so we love um, celebrating all of you as role models, all the presenters today, and those of you participating. Um, so thank you for all that. And we'll be in touch on those other ideas we talked about. Um, and Emily, I'd like to turn it back to you. Thank you for hosting today's event. If you'd like to uh, close it and tell us what the next steps are. Sure, of course. Um, yes, I just want to um, mimic and echo what Florence said. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for joining today. The research presented was incredibly interesting. And for all of those who tuned in today, those who are watching us on live stream or will be watching us on the recording in the future, um, we will be sharing the recording with everyone. You will be able to find it on our YouTube channel. You can use the links that I put in the chat to join any of our upcoming events. 
We also will be doing those transcripts as mentioned before, and those will be posted live on the Hub um, website within the coming weeks. So please keep an eye out for that. The easiest way to keep connected is joining the um, KIC newsletter where we regularly let you know about all of these new things that we're posting, new events that we're hosting, and new opportunities to collaborate and listen to others' research. Um, so thank you from the Hub. We hope you enjoyed this research presentation and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you.